Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started um, just in the interest of time. Um, thank you everyone for joining us this evening for our leadership training series. Um, as Kim said, we've been doing these training series for over two years. We've been trying to do them every month. They don't always happen every month, but we do try to do that. Um, so all of these sessions have been recorded and you can find them on our web page. Um, we'll throw in the chat the web page that shows um, all those recordings. And please feel free to share them with your colleagues. We are recording this session tonight as well. So you can, um, if you know of anybody that missed it, um, you can certainly share that with them. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a SAFER grant a few years ago, which is how we've been able to fund these leadership um, trainings. So we're really um, obviously grateful for that. Um, so tonight we have a really special guest and we're really excited about this presentation and um, we've been looking forward to it. And unfortunately, we had to reschedule. So thank you for your um, patience as we had to do that. So tonight we're going to hear from... Um, Chief Chuck Ryan, who is from Tucson, and he is going to talk about lessons learned from an active shooter incident that happened to his department, and he's going to tell you all about it. Um, but Chief Ryan um, is the fire chief in at Tucson, Arizona, and he previously served for more than 25 years with the Fairfax County Fire and Rescue Department in Virginia, and he held every promoted rank in the department, retiring as an assistant fire chief um, to take the Tucson fire chief's um, job. Chuck also served for over a decade as a task force leader and plans manager with Fairfax County's um, urban search and rescue team um, and the Virginia's um, task force one. So Chuck, welcome tonight. Um, we're so pleased to have you here and please go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Kim, for having me and, and to the folks uh, in attendance. Thank you for your time in advance. Uh, my apologies for the last hiccup that was entirely on my end and a uh, little technical issue here uh, with the city of Tucson's IT systems, but we got it resolved, so here we are. So um, as Michael said, I am uh, the fire chief for the city of Tucson, Arizona. Uh, we are the, a little bit of background, I feel I owe it to my employer to at least share this with you. Uh, the second largest fire department in the state of Arizona, uh, second only to the Phoenix Fire Department. Um, we serve a population, a full-time population of about 560,000 people over about 230 square miles. Uh, plus we support our international airport here and uh, work closely with our military partners at Davis Monthan Air Force Base, as well as the 162nd Air National Guard Wing, which is an F-16 training base here in town. So uh, we've, we, we've, we've got quite a, a footprint and, and that we're a, you know, a fairly large Metro department. Uh, so we deal with Metro and urban challenges every single day. Um, but the story I'm going to share with you today uh, goes back to July 18th of 2021. Uh, I'd been the fire chief here. I, I was appointed as Tucson's fire chief uh, in September of 2019, right at the end of September. Uh, so I'd been here uh, uh, less than two years when this event occurred. Um, but what I want to share is, as we go into this, uh, first things first, is is a, a little bit, it's a clip um, from some, just a compilation of news clips and, and the question I pose rhetorically to the group is, uh, is this our new normal? So unfortunately, the volume is a little bit lower than I would like. So I'll give you a second to turn your volumes up so you can hear these clips in, Siri, in series and then, uh, then we'll move on through the presentation. So we'll roll with it here. Police say the guy fired a shot at them. And tonight, the city of Stockton in shock and in mourning over the loss of a firefighter killed Oops. Killed in the line of duty for the on duty Winston Salem firefighter and the other person shot at an iconic Watown area eating establishment this afternoon suddenly opens fire on first responders. <laughs> firefighter Mitch Lungard was killed and the firefighters are starting to put out the flames at this point. Police say the suspect starts firing at firefighters and neighbors. That's not what we come to work to do is to get shot at. That's not what we sign up for, but Sadly, it's become part of our experience now. And our captain, uh, who had been struck, still had the presence of mind to make a very clear uh, and understandable radio report to the battalion chief, who then told all other incoming units to hold off and, and stay away. Two firefighters shot and killed while responding to a fire on Christmas Eve 
in Western New York. As we hear from the family of Elijah Boatley, the 20 year old shot and killed by deputies on Friday night. MCSO saying he was wanted for shooting at firefighters. Captain Dave Rosa leaves behind a wife and two children, as Carlos mentioned. He was a 17 year vet and was responding to a fire alarm call when he was met with gunfire. Antioch police are investigating a drive-by shooting that sent a firefighter and a paramedic to the hospital. The firefighters broke open the door. The man inside opened fire. One officer had to be pulled to safety. He was one of two officers wounded in that shootout. Lying on her back in the road. But in just a matter of seconds, someone yelled, she's got a gun. The driver, who refused medical treatment, started shooting. We do know that two uh, firefighters were shot. They are both in critical condition right now. I just got rammed here at Campbell Inn. I rammed this stuff. I rammed this stuff. Five shots fired, suspect down. So uh, the what you saw there was a compilation of clips over the past five or six, seven years uh, from across the country and uh, here in Tucson. And that ending portion of the clip was uh, the conclusion of the active shooter incident on July 18th of 2021 when a uh, Tucson police officer police uh, was rammed and uh, then neutralized the suspect. So. Uh, let's talk about the day itself, and 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 I'm there's there's a little bit of operational stuff with this, but but really we're gonna as we get through the operational stuff and setting the timeline for you, uh, talk more about uh, the challenges it posed to the department uh, and to me as a fire chief, frankly, uh, from the leadership level, uh, and, and hopefully you'll you'll glean some things from that. So July 18th, 2021, it was a it was a hot and for Tucson muggy July afternoon, fairly low call volume, kind of a normal Sunday for us. Um, our weather conditions, like I said, 90 degrees, partly cloudy skies, kind of a breezy day, humidity up around 80 percent, which again for us is really, really high. But it's our monsoon season. So you can see in that picture there, uh, you know, the monsoon, the thunderstorm clouds building up over the mountains and which creates a very common uh, July to September weather pattern for us here uh, in the Tucson Valley. So there are three different incident scenes that were that were part that formed one over overall one large incident. Um, and this what you're looking at here is a, a Google Images picture of the first scene. So uh, three three forty seven p.m. approximately, our public safety communications department here in the city receives multiple calls about a house fire uh, at this address on a street called East Irene Vista Drive. Uh, callers, multiple callers are reporting that the house is on fire, flames are coming out of the windows, neighbors are trying to determine if anyone's in the home. Less than 15 seconds or less than 20 seconds later, our station alerting packages are activated by our 911 system. And then uh, less than, what, six minutes later, uh, our first arriving truck marks on scene with a working house fire. Uh, a little bit about this area, uh, we refer to it as the Vistas. It is a uh, low to low middle income area, um, a fairly substantial minority population uh, here for the city of Tucson, a fair amount of criminal activity. TPD is, is a regular visitor there, and uh, our, our folks are no strangers either for both fires and for uh, violent crime incidents. So. So that's that's the vistas, and that and you see that house with the two with the pickup truck and the SUV in the driveway, uh, and that's a very common house for that area. Three bedrooms, two baths, single floor, uh, stucco and wood frame. At the same time, uh, we have a second incident going on. Uh, you'll notice it's about two and a half to three minutes later than the first call to nine one one for the house fire. Our communications department receiving multiple 911 calls about someone who is shot into an ambulance in the parking lot at a, uh, a nearby ball uh, park, which has uh, these fields called, we call them the Field of Dreams, on Keno Parkway nearby. It's a major thoroughfare through the city. Uh, about a minute later, dispatched for a possible shooting at that location, and TFD is told to hold off. Uh, less than a minute later, 911 is taking calls from and this is actually one of the EMTs inside the ambulance. Uh, she had the presence of mind to activate the lights and the siren after uh, what, what happened. Uh, she and her partner were shot, um, but she's not very coherent. 
and the call pings to the location where the ambulance is parked. And I'll tell you, what I can tell you is a, an AMR ambulance here in the city of Tucson, the fire department provides 911 uh, ALS service and we contract out our low acuity and BLS service to AMR. Uh, so another caller uh, has now gone up, somebody in the park uh, advises that the passenger, the driver and the passenger in the AMR ambulance have been shot. Uh, driver shot in the head, passenger shot in the arm. Uh, caller says the ambulance is in the middle of the parking lot, no one around and it's lights and siren are on. Uh, a few minutes later, uh, TPD gets on scene, confirms two shooting victims in the ambulance. And about three minutes later, they call the scene secure and we're able to proceed in to start to render aid. I think it's important to, to mention here that you know our folks work very closely with the AMR folks. Um, the AMR folks, it's sort of a pipeline to a lot of the, to the Tucson fire and a lot of other fire departments here in Arizona. Uh, mostly younger folks working for them. And these were two very young uh, basic EMTs in this ambulance. And the reason they were at the park, uh, they were they're right, you know, wrong place at the wrong time kind of thing. Um, they were staged for another TFD call that was in the area and they were waiting to see if the uh, engine company was gonna downgrade it to BLS. So they'd be a little bit closer to move in. So they, they just happened to be sitting in the parking lot, had nothing to do with the fire call, nothing to do with this active shooter. Uh, he happened upon them and and created a, a victim scene there. And then the third part of the incident uh, was right what you saw at the end of that video clip. Uh, this is the intersection you see here where the driver uh, who was the uh, active shooter was fleeing the scene and rammed a responding TPD cruiser, uh, engaged the officer in gunfire, um, and at a distance of well over 100 yards, the officer uh, struck him four times out of six shots uh, with a revolver, with his service revolver. So uh, the key about this is it's only about two and a half blocks away from where the house fire is. Uh, they exchanged gunfire across this open lot following the crash. They neutralized the threat. But this is also the exact location where our units had been staged and you're going to hear in the next slide, uh, again, I'm going to encourage you to turn your audio up so you can hear the dispatch traffic um, between our incident command, between the first in companies, our incident commander, and our 911 center. Uh, and that kind of brings this timeline together. So I'm going to advance to the next slide, give you a second to get your audio turned up. And then once you do, we will uh, we'll listen to it here. Battalion 1 responding. Engine one responding. Check engine one. All units responding. 2141 East Irene Vista. Multiple callers reporting house on fire. Flames coming out the window. Neighbors trying to see if anybody's inside yelling. Fire battalion one. Upgrade the rig. Start a second medic, please. Check battalion one. EC4 engine two. Upgrade code three. Battalion one. Additional medic is going to be medic one. I copy medic one. Engine 10 is approaching. We got smoke showing. Engine 10 is live. 10. Just be aware there's a guy telling you. Real fast, behind you. Okay, check. Thank you. Agent 10's at the scene. We have a single story, single family residential, small. We've got smoke showing from the front of the house. Single story, base reconstructed. Got a pitch asphalt shingle roof. Agent 10's going to be pulling a pre connect for primary search and fire attack. This will be a working engine. Shots fired. Code 99. We got shots being fired. No units come to the scene. We need TPD stat. All units from Battalion 1, uh, let's make sure that we stay away from the scene for Engine 10. Uh, do not approach into the scene. Let's stage away from the scene. Agent 10 for Battalion 1, are you guys able to safely get out of that scene? We've got one patient down. We're going to be clearing the scene. Battalion 1 copies. Fire line for Battalion 1, do you copy code 99? That's affirmative. Medic 10 is ladder 10. We're getting in your truck. Fire is ladder 10. We are being shot at. Ladder 10 for Battalion 1, are you guys able to exit that scene safely? Fire for Battalion. Battalion 1, go ahead and start me a... Uh, to the Sorry about that. Engine 15. Engine 15. Let me back it up just a tiny bit. You lay it to us if you're able to. Hang on. Engine 10 in the back of Medic 10, we flood the scene. From Battalion 1, do we have TPD in Route Code 3? That's permitted, sir. They have multiple units now. 
Who are my medic trucks en route? Subject is a 20s, 30s black male, still has a firearm and is shooting. Command, there's ladder 10. I have my engineer and one firefighter from engine 10 in the back of medic 10. We fled the scene. I'm missing both of my firefighters. I copy that. Which firefighters are we missing? The tell you is ladder 10. I'm missing firefighter Phillips and firefighter Palmer. Firefighter Phillips and Firefighter Palmer from Battalion 1, do you copy? This is Firefighter 2, Palmer from Ladder 10. Are you code 4, sir? I am code 4. Do you have Firefighter Phillips with you? Firefighter Phillips and Pelosi are present with me. I copy that. Captain Nielsen, Engine 10 from Battalion 1. Battalion 1, this is Engine 10. I'm by myself in a residence. I don't have the address right now. I got a GSW to the right arm. I think it's just superficial. I copy that. As soon as you can get that location, please relay it to us if you're able to. We're going outside right now. Be advised, TPD is pulling up right now. Command, we got the crew of Ladder 10, both firefighters and one engine firefighter in 2166, Irene Vista. 2166, Irene Vista. All units, the tiny one is going to assume command. I will be Vista Command. Command, fire. Fire alarm command, go ahead. What channel would you like the major medical on? We're just going to keep everything right here on A7 for right now. Check. Do I have another battalion chief responding as well? You have battalion 4, EC2, medic 22, medic 45, medic 7, all in route. Fire from command. Give me those units again. I have battalion 4, EC2. Affirmative. Ladder 1, medic 22, medic 45, and medic 7. Command, this crew 10, the shooter was walking back and forth behind ladder 10. He's in a striped shirt and uh, still holding a pistol in his right hand. Command copies fire alarm. This is command. Are we able to relay the information to TPD, please? That's affirmative. Command, be advised. We have the shooter on Campbell. He's shooting at the cops right now. We're backing up. He just hit a cop car. He's shooting at the cops. Shooter is down. The cop shot him. I copy that. Shooter is down. Cop shot him. All units from command. Let's just go ahead and stage in place right now. Command Engine 2 is moving. The shooter is down. However, he's still moving. We're going to be backing up to get away from his line of sight. I copy that, Engine 2. EC-1 from Command. Command EC-1. Once we get cleared to get into the scene, I'm going to assign you to medical. EC-1 copies that. Fire alarm from Command. Command, fire. Can we notify University? We should have at least two patients with GSWs being transported. I'll give you an update as soon as we have more information. Battalion Check. 1, EC-1, watch across the street coming out of that black truck. Command, fire. Fire alarm, command. Command, TPD wants all units to back out of the area. Meet at Quincy Douglas. I copy that. All units from command, we're going to back out of this area. Meet across the street at Quincy Douglas. Command, engine 15. Engine 15, command. We were dispatched to Quincy Douglas for an AMR unit that supposedly had people shot. Do you see anybody over there? I'll let you know as soon as we get over there, sir. Command fire, we are getting reports that AMR does have somebody shot at Quincy Douglas. I copy that. Uh, let's get one of our TFD medic trucks uh, dispatched over there. Yeah. Command, this is Medic 11. We are dispatched to the Quincy Douglas. We are going to be staging at 36 in Campbell. I copy that. Fire alarm from command. Um, do we have confirmation that from TPD that Quincy Douglas is all clear? There are no threats in that area. That's affirmative, sir. Quincy Douglas is code for. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. So you can hear uh, a, a little bit of confusion uh, because we got one tactical channel in use uh, for two different significant incidents, not knowing that they were tied together at this point, or at least at that at this point in the in the operation. So. Um, some, some a couple of things about that. Obviously, a code ninety nine for us uh, means a firefighter in uh, life life threatening danger, officer in danger. Uh, it's a common code that we use both for fire and police here. Code four means they're okay, they're safe. Um, some things I think were pretty remarkable here. Uh, the battalion chief at at this point in time was a captain acting up as an interim battalion chief. He'd probably only been doing it for about two months. Uh, amazing command presence under uh, duress, um, really, really managed the scene well. 
Uh, some, some interesting tidbits as well in there, as you may have heard in the audio with respect to uh, the latter company reporting to the engine that they had somebody tailing them very closely and at a high rate of speed into the scene. Uh, I, I don't know that that would have changed anything. Uh, I don't I don't know because that, again, that could be anything, right? That doesn't necessarily mean something nefarious. Uh, this could be the homeowner and somebody, you know, a neighbor has called and said, hey, man, your house is on fire. Get home. And so there's no no indication of violence at that point, other than it's just something for situational awareness. The other the other challenge that was presented, obviously, was when they said the AMR unit at Quincy Douglas Park, that is the Keno Parkway location, that field of dreams, the formal name for it is Quincy Douglas Park. Um, so so very close by. And so what what had what had occurred here um, was was this. So and and this map kind of gives you the layout. So down here in the lower left that you see in the red TFD station 10, that's the first do company. Uh, to the reported fire address, which is here in blue, 2141 East Irene Vista Drive. And then 2040 Keno Parkway is right up here, which is Quincy Douglas Park. You can see it right there, Quincy Douglas Center. And the AMR ambulance was parked in, the, in this parking lot. So what, what had happened, uh, as we learned in hindsight, was that the shooter uh, had set his house on fire intentionally uh, to cover up crime. He had actually uh, murdered his girlfriend, set the house on fire to cover, so arson to cover murder. He had left the scene, proceeded up Campbell Avenue, 36 to Kino, and in, and in, we can only assume that in driving by, he saw the ambulance there because what the, the one of the EMTs reported was that he walked up to the window, knocked on the window, pointed to the column of smoke and said, hey, do you guys see that house fire over there? Before they could answer, he opened fire into the ambulance. He was on the driver's side. Uh, the young gentleman that was driving was actually struck five different times, three headshots, uh, two to the torso. The young lady <clears throat> in the right front seat was struck twice, uh, once in the left breast and once in the right arm. Uh, the driver passed away several days later. He was on life support for several days, uh, waiting for family to get into town. Uh, the young lady has made a, a complete, at least complete physical recovery, but that's what she reported during the course of the police investigation. She said he, she saw him speed off and then head back down Keno Parkway, coming back down towards the location of the fire, uh, presumably to, uh, you know, try to shoot some more people basically to stop uh, the folks from uh, suppressing the fire at his house. That's when he encountered the police officer pretty much in this area where my cursor is here, Irene Vista and South Campbell. This is that lot you saw and the collision took place right about here. Um, and the, his car went careening off into the lot and the, the police cruiser was roughly right in the intersection or just into the lot. So that's sort of the layout of the land for you to give you a, a kind of picture of where it was. And that's why a lot of that stuff sounded like it was happening in rapid sequence. And it was because of the, the close proximity of everything. Um, there is very little compression in that audio. So that that tells you how quickly things like that were taking place. So uh, moving on to the next slide. Uh, this is where our captain went. Uh, you heard him mention that he had taken a, a gunshot wound to his arm. Um, what had happened was after he gave his size up report, uh, that's that's almost immediately when the shooter uh, engaged our folks. He put two rounds into the back of engine 10. The engineer had put the truck in pump gear and was getting out to go to the pump panel. The firefighters had come off the truck to pull, advance a hand line. And as the captain was finishing his radio report, the shooter walked around to the front of the cab. He raised the pistol. And we don't know if the, obviously if the pistol jammed, but we were told he said he, it looked like he squeezed the trigger. Nothing happened. He walked over to the captain's window on the right side of the truck. Uh, the captain raised his right arm to duck to shield himself. 
and he took a gunshot wound to his right bicep uh, and took a pretty good chunk out of his right arm. Uh, that's when the shooter then started to shoot at the ladder company, which had pulled past the truck uh, up into the area here at the Lloyd Vista, South Lloyd Vista intersection. So up in this area here uh, where the cursor is. He started shooting at them and then he that's when he also he dropped one of the neighbors literally at the tailboard of the ladder truck right in front of right in front of our folks uh shot another neighbor and then a third neighbor who was trying to help was running and was grazed by a bullet but not actually uh shot per se but you can see this is where captain nielsen uh bailed out into this house this neighbor took him in the other folks uh scattered into different homes or into the back of one of the medic trucks, which which then left the scene. So <clears throat> a quick summary of the three incidents. Um, the house fire, once the scene is stabilized, patient care is occurring. So we've got a working house fire and shooting victims to include one of our own. Uh, while that's taking place, firefighting is, is commenced. Once the scene is secure, uh, the house, the fire was pretty quickly brought on, the fire was pretty quickly brought under control, contained to the structure of origin, uh, still needed to conduct that primary and secondary search uh, because of potential additional victims. Uh, this, this led to a combined RTF, Rescue Task Force and firefighting operation. Uh, and we also needed animal control because uh, these folks had a couple of very large uh, pit bulls that were in the yard. Uh, so it made it a little difficult to, to navigate that. And of course, all of this is happening on a Sunday afternoon, right? So this can't happen on a Wednesday at you know one in the afternoon, right? It's it's got to happen on a summer weekend, uh, middle of the day. So a lot of our partner agencies had some delayed responses and and so on and so forth. So anyway, um, that's what we were dealing with uh, with respect to the structure fire, with respect respect to the AMR ambulance. Like I said, our, their folks and our folks work very closely every single day. Um, very chaotic scene in the parking lot there. Uh, the injuries, uh, especially to Jacob, the driver, were uh, horrific. Uh, the, the fact he still had any signs of life were amazing, uh, was amazing. Uh, and so I mentioned the relationships uh, because now your folks, our folks are treating people they know pretty darn well uh, and and for all intents and purposes are, are you know, co-responders with us. So they are our own, just like TPD would be. And then the third incident, obviously, is the police neutralization of the perp um, occurred in full view of multiple personnel. Uh, they still needed to render aid to the assailant. The police did a great job with that, um, stepped right in after after assuring their own safety. And then our our folks also assisted them with that. And obviously concern for our law enforcement partners uh, and their and their well-being. So that's the incident or the incidents, uh, but then you move into the post-incident phase. And so I can tell you as a fire chief and for those fire chiefs on the on the uh, uh, call here tonight or on the program here tonight, um, it's uh, it's it's pretty chilling when you hear radio transmissions like that. Um, Despite <laughs> despite my wife's my wife's protests, the ra the radio is often on in our house. Uh, that that just comes with the job. The phone is always on the nightstand. And uh, Sunday afternoon was just a typical day in my household, doing laundry, cleaning up a little bit. Uh, it was it was not a comfortable day to be outside, so we were inside, and uh, to to listen to that. Um, and and from my house to this location is probably a fifteen to 20 minute drive max. Um, so trying to get myself together on a Sunday afternoon to head over there. It's you, you can imagine, I think if it was your people in peril, what that what that's like. So we had this extensive coincident fire cause and crime scene investigation. Uh, like I said, uh, this was arson to cover murder. And our crews found the burned body of this gentleman's live in girlfriend. Um, in this uh, area where the boarded, you see the, the boarded up room here on the Alpha Bravo corner of the house. She was basically in that area. Uh, he had uh, shot her multiple times, rolled her up in an area rug, 
um, spread accelerant, presumably it was believed to be gasoline, soaked the rug in gasoline, spread it around the house, lit the house on fire, and then and then fled. Uh, heavy, heavy commitment of, of resources, uh, certainly a need to cooperate with the law enforcement investigation, and we'll talk about that. Our peer incident, our, our uh, uh, post team uh, engaged with that as well for uh, mental health resources. And then again, accessing other resources on a Sunday afternoon in the summertime, challenging. And there, it was like there was nothing else going on in Tucson this day. And there were very heavy media demands, both at the scene and in the days following. Uh, this drew national media attention very quickly. Um, and, and so the next slide I'm going to share with you here. Uh, and before I go there, before I go there, I want to mention this picture uh, down here in the uh, lower right of your screen where the pickup truck is parked. Um, this house has a role in this incident. It is basically directly across the street um, from the house where the fire occurred and the murder. Um, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, there's another, this next slide I'm going to run for you also has audio. I'll give you a moment to turn it up and I'll let this thing run for its conclusion. This is the next day press conference. Um, when I've given this presentation before, I've kind of laid some groundwork for this. What you'll see is uh, this press conference was held at uh, police headquarters in their media room. Um, the police chief, the then police chief for Tucson, uh, introduces me, and then I, I give my little spiel to the media. Uh, I will preface this by saying this is not a gee whiz, look what a great job I did talking to the media. Um, there's a reason I said what I said in here, and we'll talk about that after this run. So go ahead and turn your volume up, and hopefully this one will be loud enough for you to hear. Bill from our fire chief, uh, Chief Ryan. Thanks, Chief. Um, what you just heard, um, that radio traffic, uh, could not, uh, and, I, and I say this hesitatingly, <clears throat> is difficult at best. It's about the eighth time I've heard it since hearing it live the other day, yesterday. Uh, I could not be more proud of our men and women. Uh, this is so far out of the realm of what is normal. Uh, that is, it's, it's unconscionable, and it's difficult to not be intensely angry about what occurred. Um, it's trying to make sense of a senseless act like this is, is almost futile. Um, but what I can tell you is that our captain, uh, our crews did exactly what they're trained to do. Um, we train with our partners at Tucson Police to respond to active shooter incidents. We don't train to be a part of them. Uh, and our crew found themselves in the midst of, of this horrific mess yesterday. Uh, our captain handled himself and his crew with professionalism and true leadership, uh, maintaining a sense of composure and calm that I'm not sure that I could have. Um, I, I spoke to him this morning. He was treated yesterday at Banner UMC, uh, and it was great to hear his voice this morning. He went home last night uh, to his wife and family. And I can tell you, it, he's extremely humble and said, Chief, it's just a superficial wound. Um, getting, there's nothing superficial about getting shot, okay? Um, and so, what, what I've told uh, our members is that we will be there to support them, uh, Chief Magnus. We have a, a robust peer support team. We work with uh, the U of A and Dr. Patricia Haynes uh, for behavioral health support. And Chief Magnus has graciously offered the assistance of TPD's behavioral health support unit to our members that need it. Uh, we, we respond to over 90,000 calls for service in this city every year. We will continue to do so. We will continue to serve this community professionally and proudly, but I will have to tell you that it's an incident like this that can shake shake your trust a little bit. And it's gonna take a little bit of time to get back to good, as they say. Uh, I've had the good fortune to have been contacted by fire chiefs from across the country, from major metropolitan cities, some colleagues in Canada as well, some of whom have gone through this with much more tragic outcomes. Uh, having that support network is good as a chief officer because I think as Chief Magnus would join me in saying uh, there's no more uh, empty and helpless feeling than when you're listening to your crews in peril on the radio and you can't do anything about it. Um, I also want to make sure we thank our public safety communications department. Uh, all too often our dispatchers and uh, call takers who handle these events get forgotten in the mix. 
and I want to make sure they're recognized because they also uh, demonstrated extreme composure under duress. And I do want to thank uh, the members of the community along that street who took our members in. I think you heard in the radio traffic that several members took uh, refuge in some homes. Um, it's only by the good grace of those neighbors that sheltered our, our co-workers that they were safe. Thank you. So, um, again, apologies for the low audio. It's it's just the way it is in this built into the program, but um, or built into the slide deck. But in the video, uh, the 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 woman over my right shoulder on screen left is our mayor. Um, I think I think it's important. It's at least for me, from my perspective, important to understand what was going on uh, in the national conversation and here in Tucson um, during that time period. So summer of 2020, obviously a lot of civil unrest in the United States. Uh, Tucson was no stranger to that in the wake of the George Floyd shooting uh, or shooting George Floyd in custody death in Minneapolis. Um, uh, here in Tucson, we had several weeks, weekends of uh, significant civil unrest activity in the city. Um, we have a somewhat activist mayor and council. Uh, we are a university town. The University of Arizona is here. Uh, and so there was a, a lot of angst still in the air over this, uh, th that whole national conversation. <clears throat> Compounding it, uh, was that Tucson Police Department, as well as Tucson Fire, were involved in an incident where a uh, young man who was uh, uh, exceedingly high on multiple illegal narcotics uh, went into excited delirium, uh, was restrained by police. Uh, our medics showed up, uh, and uh, the the man was in cardiac arrest by the time our crew got there. But so here we have a, a minority male, a Hispanic, Mexican-American male, um, you know, in the community conversation here, died at the hands of police. He was struggling with mental health issues. His family was the one that called the police. But so, so this incident came on the heels of that as well. And what I haven't told you about this is that the shooter uh, in this event was an African-American male. Um, he had had multiple encounters with uh, Tucson police, Arizona DPS, Department of Public Safety, some other local police agencies. Uh, he was known, he, he was in mental health treatment and he was also a felon in possession uh, on the day of the shooting. So um, a lot of that comes into play here and create a lot of political stress for our mayor uh, and for our police chief. Not so much for me. Um, the mayor and I, I'm not gonna say anything bad about my mayor. She's, a, she's actually a very good, she's become a good personal friend of my wife and I, but she's a political animal and uh, that's, you know, mayors, politicians do what they do. Uh, and if you, if you work or if you're a chief in a municipal department, you know that's your elected officials they're going to do what they need to do for their own skin at the end of the day. Not that they abandoned us or anything else, but they have a, they have a career to protect. Um, the mayor's chief of staff, if, if you deal with folks like this, they are interesting folks. And the chief of staff at the time, literally, as I walked into this press conference, which I begged them not to do, uh, I said, let's give it a couple of days. But the police chief was under a lot of pressure. Mayor was under a lot of pressure. They decided they got to move forward with this police, with this press conference. I wanted candidly to have no part of it, but they said, nope, you need to hear from the fire chief. So here I am. Some things you just do, right? Um, and the mayor's chief of staff approached me off to the side before it started and said, the mayor wants you to specifically mention the shooter by name and express sympathy for his family. And I... That was my that was my that was my heart stop. I said, absolutely not. I will not do that. I said, the police chief can do it if he wants to. She said, no, the mayor wants you to do it. And I said, then the mayor's gonna have to ask me and I'll have to tell the mayor no. And 
You did not hear me mention the shooter's name, nor did you hear me give any grace to his family. Um, that was just not going to come out of my mouth that day, uh, nor has it any day since. Um, and and so for the chiefs on here, uh, you got to pick you got to pick your your battle right and um, and, and know where you're going to stand. Now that chief of staff is no longer the mayor's chief of staff. This press conference had nothing to do with that, but that's that's the kind of political structure uh, that that I was dealing with as a fire chief. And I know in talking to some other fire chiefs from major cities uh, who've had these sorts of things uh, occur, they face somewhat similar challenges, although it tends to be rest a little heavier with, with their police chiefs. Um, but that, that was it. And I felt it was important in that conversation to, to acknowledge the people that we acknowledged, um, you know, the 911 dispatchers, and especially the residents of that community. That's who I was willing to say thank you to uh, because candidly, the police don't have a great uh, relationship in that community. Well, at the time they didn't, it's, it's improving. Uh, and, and nor did we, right? Because most of the, most of the calls there had negative outcomes uh, irrespective of our interventions. So uh, a, a lot of distrust with public safety in that community. And, my my intent there was was I was intentional with that uh, for a whole host of reasons. So so moving forward in the in the months ahead, really, uh, we needed to let things kind of run their course before we did anything with respect to a post incident analysis. Um, this was one. This was this was new to Tucson. Um, certainly, we've had crews uh, get in fights with folks have guns pulled, have knives pulled, things like that, but never actively shot at previously. Um, we also wanted to give the members a chance to heal from the incident. Um, our captain uh, that was shot, he was the only uh, member that was actually physically harmed uh, in the event. He came back to work very briefly uh, and then went back on uh, leave and subsequently retired with a uh, disability pension. Uh, physically, he was cleared to return to duty, but he was never never the same afterward. Uh, dealt with a lot of anger management issues, a lot of guilt issues. Um, and thankfully here in Arizona, we have a law uh, called the Craig Tiger Act, which recognizes uh, job-related post-traumatic stress as a qualifying disability. And so uh, Captain Nielsen, worked diligently to come back, but he just didn't have it in him. And he has since, he and his family have since even moved out of the area, they've moved to Texas. Um, so so that was that was painful for our folks. And, and there were parts of the, even from after the incident through uh, several months, probably six months to a year following that were painful. But the post-incident analysis process was, was uh, necessary. Definitely not easy. It took a long time can't rush this. We've all, if you've been in the fire service for more than a minute, you know, you've been to a call, a significant incident, and then you read the post-incident analysis or you're part of the conversation. You sit there wondering, was, was, I, was I even at the same thing? You know, are we talking about the same event I was at? Um, we wanted this, I wanted this to be very intentional, very honest, uh, very open and very transparent. And we timed it very intentionally from beginning to end of the process. Um, the other thing I would encourage you to do is anytime you have you do a post incident analysis, don't spring it on your people. The folks who are most closely impacted from the event deserve to see it first. Um, they had the firsthand knowledge. Unless you were there, you didn't. Uh, and most often the folks writing the narrative were not there. So they get to see it. They should always get to see it first. So there's no surprises for them. Uh, you have to be willing to have this open and honest assessment of every aspect of the response um, to include how you handle things in the days and weeks afterward. Um, you know, one of the questions I got asked by the media fairly routinely after this was, um, you know, what could you have done differently? My answer was, you know, initially, I don't think there's anything we could have done differently. We responded to a house fire and encountered somebody shooting at us. There was no, 
precursor to let us know. Um, you have, I think you have to defend your people or at least defend your process if you can't defend your people until the facts all flesh themselves out. Uh, you have to be prepared when you have this post-incident analysis to turn it over to folks who may not have or don't have a vested interest in the outcome. Um, we invited uh, outside agencies to have a representative in our PIA for this, um, just so there wasn't, you know, there weren't by internal uh, or unconscious biases that were going to creep in. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were an open book and and let let the facts fall where they may. So you have to be ready to read about some shortcomings and uncomfortable things. And it's not about a blame game or defensive posturing. You have to look at it as an, as an opportunity to improve. Uh, unless there's a significant policy violation, it's not, shouldn't be a basis for discipline. Um, you have to see it as a, as, a, as a way to get better and hopefully prevent something like this from happening in the future. So some key takeaways for us, um, first off, reaffirming that there's no such thing as a routine call. I, I, I get to speak at FDIC almost every year. And one of the things I use in my presentation, it's not this one, it's a different one about size up, but it was a multi-firefighter, multi multi light of duty death for the San Francisco Fire Department, uh, probably close to seven or eight years ago now. Um, and the headline the next day on the San Francisco Chronicle was uh, the two firefighters from the San Francisco Fire Department died in a quote unquote bread and butter house fire call. There's no such thing. Uh, and this just reaffirms it. Um, people and vehicles following your units into the scene should be an item of concern or at least awareness. Uh, again, outset, not a, not a real, uh, not, not unexpected, but definitely something to be watching for. Radio discipline, uh, practice, I say practice until you can't get it wrong. One of the things that I that I'm convinced plagues our profession is a lack of radio discipline. I attribute that to the fact that uh, for at least Metro Fire Departments, for most larger departments, uh, over 80 percent of what we do is EMS. And how our folks talk on the radio is based on EMS incidents and how they talk on EMS incidents needs to be very different than how radio discipline should be on fire incidents um, or, or incidents that are rapidly evolving and expanding. <clears throat> they tend to take on a, a tenor of a cell phone conversation because many respects, that's how they are communicating, right? They're talking on a cell phone link or a radio link to a hospital, a charge nurse, an ER nurse, and relaying information in highly narrative format. I always encourage people to listen to air traffic control communications and listen to the amount of information that transfers back and forth in very rapid sequence. Um, and I encourage our folks uh, and folks that I talk to to approach radio communications from that aspect and eliminate all the pleasantries and all the prepositional phrases and keep it short and to the point. I think if you think back to how uh, Chief Carnap conducted his command scene, uh, his command of that scene, you, you heard that there was very little chatter uh, on the radio uh, because you, have, you only have to read a few NIOSH reports to realize that lack of airtime can kill firefighters, uh, prevent maydays from being heard and, and such. So um, radio discipline is key. Requesting additional resources early, super important. I always tell, I've told my folks, I'd rather you uh, request additional resources and not need them then fall way behind the eight ball and we're playing catch up on the incident. We can always turn them around. I'll take the risk any day of a truck getting in an accident over one of our people uh, suffering an adverse outcome because we had a hesitation in requesting early uh, resources early. Um, you heard it on there. If you have your, if your system allows for it to certainly pre-alert or give a heads up to your hospital emergency departments when you're expecting multiple patients, uh, the last thing they want is to have uh, multiple patients dropped on them. We have two level one trauma centers here in the city of Tucson, uh, two other level twos and one level three. Um, we do not have a regional hospital coordinating system here like we had back in the national capital region. Still something that's being worked on, but to the extent your uh, communications 
folks can let the hospitals know to potentially expect multiple trauma patients. That will be a big help to them. Uh, the other thing is if your radio system and your radio processes and procedures allow for it, request those, have your ICs request additional radio channels to help manage communications. Use We call them ECs here, executive captains. There are EMS supervisors. Um, they are they are fire captains in a in a support role to the battalion chief. So they operate in a battalion management team. They respond individually, but operate as a battalion management team. Um, so using folks, having an IC aid, a deputy uh, to help manage radio, multiple radio channels is really important, especially if you're going to get into uh, air operations, if you need a you know medevac, that sort of thing, or you're running what we call a major medical. Some places call it EMS task force. You know, triage, trans, treatment, and transport. However, you however you manage it in your place, uh, trying to pile all that onto a single radio uh, operational tactical radio channel is really challenging. So, trying to use multiple channels for that would be would be helpful. Uh, some other takeaways: this, when holding off for a law enforcement clearance situation, constantly assess that environment to determine if you're possibly too close to the hot zone. I think one thing that we learned, I know we learned from this, was that staging a block away uh, was not the best idea because by the time the unit, the second alarm units, a greater alarm response unit started showing up, um, they were way too close to the action, as you heard. They became almost part of the action. So we've, we've revised our processes a little bit uh, to, to stage even further away for those greater alarm assignments. Um, when there's a law enforcement hold off situation. And, and that's something we encounter here with uh, some degree of regularity, actually. Um, be mindful for the need for crew rehab, replacement and rotation. Uh, again, Sunday afternoon, right? So everybody's got to come back to work. Our, our logs chief had to come back in, open up the warehouse, get a crew, you know, get some folks in to start stocking uh, extra equipment, fresh turnout gear, um, setting up that larger rehab unit. Um, the other thing at the time that that we were dealing with here was a staffing issue. Um, we would, uh, Tucson Fire would brown out trucks uh, when we had low staffing. And this Sunday was one of those days. So we did not have our full complement of, we normally have 23 engine companies, 14 ladder companies, uh, 17 paramedic trucks, in service, I think we were down to 14 paramedic trucks that day. Uh, we might have been down an engine company again, just due to summertime leave and staffing shortages. Uh, we don't deal, we don't operate that way anymore. We actually use mandatory holdover and recall. Not the most popular thing, but it's what the citizens uh, deserve. Um, so, and and our staffing has greatly improved. But getting getting crews refreshed, one of the, especially for us, hot summer, muggy muggy day. Um, getting those folks turned out and, and rehabbed and if necessary, sent home, super important. Uh, establish or assist on unified command with your law enforcement agency. Easier said than done in a lot of places. I understand that. Um, the police chief that you saw in the news conference uh, footage, the press conference footage, he is no longer our police chief. To say that he and I had a less than optimal relationship would be probably putting it kindly. Um, we just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. He was sort of a different cat. Our current police chief and I, uh, it couldn't have, it, it couldn't be more 180. We are very good personal and professional friends. Our agencies work together extremely well. Um, so it's amazing what it, what a little bit of change of scenery will do sometimes. But getting your law enforcement partners to participate in unified command uh, is an important piece to this. First, on the fire response side, because we got to put the fire out, treat and transport the patients, but then it becomes a law enforcement event. And you need, we need fire folks engaged uh, for as long as our folks are part of that law enforcement process. Uh, building out your ICS structure, whether you use Blue Card, NIMS ICS, whatever you use. Uh, just don't lose span of control. Um, so build, make sure your ICs are, are using a good span of control and not getting overwhelmed. Again, the IC has to be the voice of reason and calm here, cannot be the screamer. You really need to work with your folks on that. 
Um, as always, scene safety and personnel safety have to be the paramount consideration. You know, all our folks want to do is get in and put the fire out and do the right thing. Uh, in this situation, it was hard for them to disentang disentangle and hold off for an ex what we felt was an extensive period of time until PD could at least make reasonably sure there was no other uh, shooter threat involved. And then engaging those behavioral health resources immediately is, is critical. So the major lesson learned for us, and, and we're going to break this down in a second, um, but is to have a protocol or plan for supplemental training for senior leadership. So I'm talking about the fire chief, your executive leadership team, your senior leadership team, on how you're going to manage post-incident communications and personnel management to support mental health recovery. And this quote that you see uh, comes right out of the PIA about reestablishing that sense of safety, providing information about the incident in regular intervals, orienting people towards policy, uh, identifying strengths rather than weaknesses, prioritizing access to basic needs. I'll talk about that in a second. Contact with loved ones. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then supporting them through uh, you know, the post-incident process and a calm post-incident scene. Um, so let's, let's break this down a little bit. So if you're the chief, what is your plan, right? How, how do you establish that sense of safety by providing information? Um, nature hates a vacuum. And when there's a vacuum, rumor and innuendo comes flooding in, uh, and what challenged it, challenged it here and will challenge it for you is this is a law enforcement event. Uh, once the fire's out, it's 100% a law enforcement event. We knew it was a, now we're dealing with a multiple homicide event. We're dealing with an arson. Um, we're, de we're dealing with a whole host of crimes to which our folks are eyewitnesses in, you know, there in the heat of the action. <clears throat> so who controls that information flow? And your folks, our folks want information that you may not be able to give them are not allowed to give them because it's now an ongoing criminal investigation. Orienting people towards policy is tough because everybody has the best answer on how this incident should go. Everybody's going to armchair quarterback you, um, identify flaws in your policy. Um, but as long as you orient, if you stick to policy, you are in a much better place. Even if your policy isn't great, right? That can be worked on. But try not to deviate from your policy because that's where you and your agency can really get yourselves into some hot water. Identify strengths and performance, right? Strong communication, strong command presence, very good radio discipline by all the crews, smart action by pulling. I mean, everything that to the extent there was a right to this incident went right for us that day, other than our captain getting shot. Um, prioritizing access to basic needs and contact with loved ones. So I don't know what the law is in Montana, and I know we have a, at least one person from another state, from Colorado on there. I don't know what your state laws are. I can tell you in Arizona, um, it is an Arizona revised statute that law enforcement can detain you without counsel for up to 24 hours if you are the witness to a homicide or other major crime. That is was an eye opener to me when I learned that. Uh, obviously, we had folks that wanted to go home. We had loved ones calling nine one one, calling uh, you know friends' cell phones. They're seeing this on the media, right? It's the information age. You're never going to get ahead of that. Rumors were spiraling on social media, uh, so it, it, you're not going to control that. You, you're not going to contain the genie in the bottle. You just got to manage it, right? Um, so so one of the things that happened here uh, and part of the less than optimal relationship was we were trying to get folks home. We were trying to get folks some uh, immediate post-counseling and the police didn't want that to happen. And they have a reason for it because they don't want people to start confabulating what happened. You're a, you're a your best recollection of anything is in the moments after. But again, this was a Sunday afternoon and we had to take, we took our folks, they set up a, a witness gathering spot in the uh, 
Uh, Banner Health System is our primary uh, health system here in Tucson. They have a large university medical center, Banner UMC, affiliated with the University of Arizona Medical School. And so that's where our folks were in their chapel, and they were basically sequestered for several hours. We don't stock uniforms, um, so we, we use a uniform vendor. We had, we had folks who were in bloody clothing. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of a hot mess for several hours, and we took a lot of heat over it, and probably rightfully so, um, but as forceful as I was with the police chief, he was as forceful back and he had the law on his side with this one. We were finally able to get folks, you know, at least some kind of change of clothing, um, allow them access to their cell phones so they could contact loved ones, things like that. We were able to get our chaplain and our post team in there, uh, which then started to calm things down. But the first couple of hours afterward were pretty chaotic and, uh, and, and pretty frustrating. So uh, as we get ready to wrap this up, and I'm happy to take um, any questions if you, if you throw them in the chat uh, or we want to just open up afterward, but here's, here's what I can offer to you. Be present with your folks. Um, they, they need to see you. Uh, work as best you can with your police counterpart, whether it's a county sheriff or a, a city or town police chief. Allow yourself to be vulnerable. Um, you know, nothing about that press conference was an act. You could, you probably, if you could have, hear it, uh, hear my voice crack. I, I was, I was pretty emotional about it. I still, I still have issues with this one uh, because we almost lost a couple of people. Um, you have to be a voice of reason for your department and your community. And uh, I wasn't going to throw the fire department into the flames on this one and take any heat for it. We were the victim here and I was going to make sure that the community knew it that my members knew that I felt that way about it and that our elected officials knew I felt that way about it. Don't downplay the event. Um, you know, you heard Captain uh, Nielsen stay on, say on there, it's just a superficial gunshot wound. Uh, yeah, no, getting shot's not superficial. I've not been shot and I don't ever wanna be shot, but I guarantee you it's not, it's nothing to take lightly. So never downplay it. Definitely give your time, your department the time to heal. Play well with the media. Um, or the, to the extent you can foster good media relations before the event occurs, uh, they will treat you better. Uh, and be ready for the tough questions. They're gonna ask those questions. What could you have done differently? Are you satisfied with the performance of your crew? How do you feel about the shooter? You know, things like that. And, and having, having a script in your head a little bit ahead of time, don't, don't rush to answer any questions. Um, it will be helpful to you. And be open to that constructive critique, right? That some of that stuff in the PIA that I just shared with you was directed directly at me, directly at senior leadership, and that's fine. That's you know you're at the pointy end of the spear as a fire chief, and you have to you have to be able to take it as well as dish it out. Um, and listen to your people. I can't tell you. I, I probably had five or six. I have an open door policy. I had five or six of members from this from this uh, event who were firsthand to it come in and and really lay it on me. You know that they not me personally but just kind of venting about how they felt they were let down and they didn't have a full understanding of, of what was going on behind the scenes or what the police authority was here. So be available to them and listen to them and let, let them get it off their chest respectfully. Of course, I'm not saying you have to be a, a punching bag, but um, yeah, being there for your folks goes a long, long way. Um, and then lastly, provide those resources, any kind of reassurance and comfort that you have their back uh, that you can, but you have to have that dose of reality, right? Like I said, orient people to policy and, and keep them focused on what the realities are. You know, we can't prevent these things from happen, happening, but we can certainly um, plan for them to some degree. And now that we've been through it once, we've, you know, we've got some lessons learned. So God forbid, if it happens again, uh, we'll be a little bit better the next time. Uh, and so as I, as I wrap this up, my, my talking up, um, I always dedicate this program uh, to the three, three people in our community that, that lost their lives that day. Um, Ms. Jennifer Fells, she was the mother of three. One of the things with this fire we did not know is where the children were. Um, we, thought for, we thought the police believed they may have been in the house uh, or killed elsewhere by this gentleman. Um, they were not. 
Ms. Fells uh, knew there was trouble brewing and she had basically hid the kids with her mom uh, the night prior to this. So she died that day as a victim of domestic violence. Um, Corey Saunders, Mr. Corey Saunders uh, was shot point blank in the head. He was the next door neighbor of the shooter. Uh, his wife said that they had a great relationship and uh, he, he became a, he was just trying to put the fire out with the green line, you know, had the garden hose and up comes his neighbor and, and flat out kills him in the street. And then Jacob Dindinger, who was the uh, AMR EMT who died 12 days later, but he had very recently tested for our upcoming, one of our upcoming academies at the time, uh, which a lot of AMR folks do. So it's dedicated to them. And before I wrap, I will say the one thing um, I showed you the picture of that house early on a truck, a gold pickup truck parked in front. Um, that house had been. Christmas prior to this event. The shooters, stepdad and his mother, they both perished in that fire. And the crew that responded to this incident and got shot at and shot by him, treated him for superficial burns that night uh, when his parents' house caught on fire. So it's a it was a really weird twilight zone sort of twist of events that came into play and, and all culminate, culminated in a pretty tragic event on uh, July 18th, 2021. So uh, thank you for your time. I'll hang out. If anybody has any questions, uh, certainly happy to take them and I'll go ahead and, and stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Chief Ryan, for sharing that incident with us. That was that was really amazing for you to um, do that. I'm sure it's not easy to live through uh, um, every time you do that presentation, but we are so grateful for your lessons learned and your takeaways. So thank you for that. Um, so I just want to open it up for any questions or comments. Just go ahead and turn your cameras on and um, ask Chief Ryan anything you'd like to ask him. Um, I, I do see one in the chat here, Josh uh, from Bozeman proposed this question. Uh, any major changes that we've implemented on fire medical responses from this event? Uh, no, other than that we do uh, make mention of it. We use it um, as, a, as an incident that we review in our captain certification classes. Uh, it's something our folks have to take before they are eligible to compete for the captain promotional process. Um, but we really didn't implement any significant operational changes other than just occurring, um, encouraging stronger situational awareness. Uh, we've worked with our partners in communications about um, doing a little bit better information sharing with respect to uh, tying incidents together. Um, you know, again, th there's no way that they really would have known that the shooting at the park, and again, I hate to say it, it sounds, it sounds terrible, but Shootings at that park are not uncommon either, right? So, but the two events in such close time and in such close proximity is something that probably should have, could have been relayed, if not by CAD message, then by radio to the yeah. incident commander. Um, so that's something we've worked on with our comms folks. And they are a standalone department, right? They have their own director. They serve both Tucson Police, Tucson Fire, as well as some other smaller police departments and regional fire departments around us. Um, so they have their own protocols and their own director that I have to work with. The second part of Josh's question with respect to RTF, Rescue Task Force, how involved in training is TFD with TPD and how often to what extent? Uh, every We do it annually with them uh, for in-service training. We also, we use, uh, we use uh, learning management system, vector solutions, target solutions, uh, so that it, it's an annual refresher for us on that. And it's taught as a two-day class in each of our recruit academies. I can tell you that every member, every uniform member of Tucson Fire, well, every riding position in the field now has an assigned ballistic vest and helmet. Um, every every staff officer, every battalion chief from, from me on down has a ballistic vest and helmet um, just because of the, unfortunately, the dangers we, we can run into here. Uh, we had previously only had them with our battalion chiefs. They would have a set of 
for vests, for helmets to help put together an RTF. But that's that's how we roll now. Everybody's and through either general fund purchasing or grant funding. That's that's how we've gotten to that point. Perfect. Thanks, Chief. You bet, Josh. Right. Thanks for your questions, Josh. Um, any other questions or comments? Chief, this is Eric Class from Colorado. I just had a quick question, and I want to get in the weeds about the operation. But you talked about the uh, you, you know need for unified command and how we link up with law enforcement when their scene is so active. We're staged, um, but how did you guys? How did you re-engage in the in the firefight? Um, after that had went down, when did you know, was that, did that go through your dispatch center? Did your IC end up getting a link? And then lastly, was your, would you consider your firefighting operation like an RTF? Was there protection for the hose lines at that point? I mean, that just, what a dynamic scene. Yeah. So great question. And um, so here's how that played out. Uh, after the crews uh, cleared the scene, TPD, as quickly as they could assess that there was no other immediate threat, we re-engaged and uh, didn't, we, we use, we, we very actively employ uh, exterior knockdown under the right conditions. Uh, this was certainly the right condition. So a quick, a quick exterior knockdown, the windows had vented from the house. Um, so a quick knockdown, but we had two officers that got a probably three and a half minute lesson in SCBA. <laughs> uh, and our folks donned their, uh, they took off their turnout coats, donned their ballistic vests, reapplied their turnout coats, and then went in uh, at least in, you know, within a few feet of the front door um, with TPD there uh, with their right, you know, they, at that point they switched to rifles. Um, so they, they were ready to engage if, if necessary. It was it, yeah, it was it was a, it was a little bit different, and I I got there as I got to the scene as they were coming out, and I I part of me wishes I had the presence of mind to take a picture of it because I don't know that I've ever seen it, and I I really don't ever want to see it again. But it was pretty unique to see police officers wearing SCBA. But that's that's how we reengaged. Uh, thanks, Chief. That's that's just nothing short of amazing. That's that's unbelievable. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for being here tonight. Hey, Chief Ryan, it's Will Seeley from Gold Ranch. How are you? Hey, Will, how are you? Great. Hey, I had a question as far as um, <clears throat> after the incident, did you have any members that did not want to participate in a formal post-incident, um, you know, with uh, professional help or peer support? How did you deal with that if they did, if there were folks like that? Um, and what have you guys like talking about the uniforms and stuff like that being bloodied and stuff, were there any changes that you guys made, you know, with maybe keeping some gear on the, on the BC trucks or anything like that? Or have you guys formalized that into a policy and just kind of where you stand with that? Yeah. So, um, with respect to the, the engagement with behavioral health resources, I was not told of any, I don't know of anybody who flat out refused to engage. Um, our, our approach here is a little bit, so So um, I, I would like to be in a position where we could at least require folks to have a check-in, right? Doesn't mean they have to go through a complete session or whatever, but have a check-in with our contracted clinical psychologist. Uh, that's not the approach we presently take. She does not necessarily favor that. Um, the police here in Arizona, I don't know if you know, but under AZ Post, they have to do it, uh, especially for officer-involved shootings. They have to go through uh, a mental health uh, assessment um, following uh, a significant incident. We don't. Um, maybe we'll get there, but but for right now, we're, we're not at that. Like I said, I, I was not made aware of anybody refusing, but I don't know if people opted out uh yeah i just don't know with respect to the logistics piece and the gear um no not a lot has changed with that other what about what has changed at least for now with chief casmar the tucson police chief he we have a a understanding and agreement that if something like this should happen again 
we will have access to our folks. They will have access to their cell phones. We can we can get you know a crew. We can get crews to bring either plain uniform uniforms from the station or PT clothes or something. Uh, but we we just don't have the the warehouse capacity to stock a wide variety of pants and shirts and and things like that. So um, with our vendor, if it's a weekday, we could probably get in there. I, matter of fact, I know we can get in there and get stuff. But again, Sunday afternoon, um, yeah, and you know, almost three years ago now too. So we're in a little bit better place with the planning on that. We don't have anything specifically formalized, but I I, I trust Chief Kazmar and, and we'd be able to navigate that pretty easily. The, the main issue with that candidly was um, the police chief at the time. Thanks, Chief. I really appreciate it. Yep. Thanks for your great questions. We have a little time if you want, have any more questions. Did you see the they they stock um Crocs and Scrubs in, in Bozeman? <laughs> yeah, cro Crocs are very popular here. Also, <laughs> we we don't stock them, but they're the footwear of choice in the stations. <laughs> Any other questions? Yesterday, oh, no. I was going to say one other thing for Josh. You know, that's a really good point. Um, and I, I you know, that's uh, I'd have to go back and talk to the folks at the time why that wasn't. Like, why couldn't we have gone, if nothing else, uh, to the hospital's stores and and gotten some Tyvek scrub or something, right? Um, I don't know that that was or was not explored, but that's a, that's a, that's a good point. That's an interesting point. I'll make a note of that one. Sorry, somebody else was going to have a question. Okay. Well, Chief Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I just want to let everyone know that Chief Ryan will actually be joining us at the Chiefs Convention or the Fire Service Convention that we're having in Missoula, October 9th through the 11th. So please um, come there and you can listen to him present again. He's presenting a couple of times. And then I did just want to share another thing with you. Um, next week, we are doing another presentation. And this is the presentation we're doing next week. And actually, Zam is on with us. Sam, if you want to turn your camera on and say hi, he is, um, he's, he joined us this evening and he will be with us next week, next Tuesday. And I have the link here to register for that um, training. So next Tuesday at 6.30. And Zam will also be joining us at the convention. So both of those gentlemen will be at the convention um, doing presentations for us. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I did put an evaluate. Oh, there he is. Hey, Zam, how are you? <laughs> Hi. Hi. Great job, Chief. Appreciate it. Going to be a tough act to follow. But I, you got. I was working out a little bit uh, throughout that, too, <laughs> just doing some mobility work prepping for next week. But um <laughs> You know, actually, why I got you, Chief, I, one question I, I kind of had was uh, your dispatchers seem to do a very good job there. And were they included in the after actions? And um, how did you incorporate them in, uh, you know, after all of this? Um, I, yes, they were. So I, I, as the fire chief, Sam took a, a very other than sort of saying this, this is how we need to approach this. I took a hands off. I let I let the team do their thing and the chips fall where they may. I do know that they engaged uh, the folks from Public Safety Communications. Um, I'm I'm confident they had a, a, at least a representative as part of the PIA compilation team. I don't know the particulars of it though. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Very very well done. Thank you. Sir. We'll see you next uh, unbelievable Tuesday. Unbelievable story. <laughs> Okay, um, so let's see, I did put the link to the evaluation in the chat. Um, and I also really quickly will put, um, we have a certificate of completion, if you'd like to put that in your files. I'm going to put that in the chat right now. 
So that is the certificate of completion. So you can just open um, all those links and they'll be across your, your browser when you get off the call and you can fill out the evaluation, register for next week's presentation, and then print out that certificate um, of completion for yourself. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, Chief Ryan. Again, we really appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you in Missoula. And everyone have a great evening. Have a good evening, everybody. All right. Thank you so Take much for your care. time. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, Chief.